Hey, what up, guys? Long time no see. I've been through a lot lately, but now I'm back. Rising from my own ashes like the phoenix, here to share with you my most ambitious project to date, Podracer Auriga. Enjoy. Stay with me all through the scratch building process of my personal interpretation of a pod racer, a clear blend between a distant future and a glorious past. Watch me build an ancient Rome chariot inspired control pod with its powerful racing engines and sculpt the figure of the cosmic Auriga. And to top it all, let me entertain you with some special effects a quite realistic energy binder arc. Now this is pod racing! The control part of this pod racer of mine is a personal interpretation of an ancient Roman chariot. Many of you guys might have become familiar with ancient Roman chariots after seeing movies such as Ben Hur or The Gladiator. The main body of the chariot is made of a head peak plastic insert, a quite stiff piece of plastic, I have to say. A thick plastic chunk is shaped into the base of the chariot. The base is then bogged out gluing a PVC pipe cut into two semicircles and bricks, which are also used as support for the wheel's axle. The springy head visor is then secured into place with rivets. Two custom bits are created to elongate and embellish the back of the chariot. Eons ago I saved these black plastic hooks, ravaged from an old cabinet, to make fine decorations on a Roman chariot inspired pod racer someday. I can't believe it! I just knew he would buy it. And now to give the inside of the chariot a more sci-fi look, according to my sketches. How can you do this? Well, I thought I'd use this round shape brick here, and some corrugated pipes made wrapping metal wire around some leftover trimmer line. I imagine this device to be some sort of interface or alien control panel through which the charioteer drives and operates the chariot. Oh, not bad, not bad! Huh? The gribbling process continues adding what I believe to be sprues of some toy line. They've got a cool shape, I think. These round ones, for example, come from Lego flowers. This much I can tell you. I thought I'd use this plastic mesh for gardening that had been sitting around in my workshop for ages to gribble the frontal part of the chariot. With this mesh, I'm trying to create some unusual patterns that might be interesting to the eye and uh, that would recall both some art decoration coming from a long lost civilization, but also from a distant future, like a circuit board pattern or something. So something timeless you tried to create? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. After gluing another strip of that same mesh on the bottom of the chariot, I think I can call it good. Wait a minute, I forgot to add details underneath the chariot. Hey, Teddy Dan, are you crazy? Nobody will see them. This is nuts. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say, isn't this the way it should be? Thank you, Mando. The wheel axle is hit with a marker pen barrel. Other corrugated pipes are made, this time wrapping some very ductile aluminium wire around leftover trimmer line bits. A cool shaped little brick is used both to provide the two pipes something to cling to and to conceal this rivet here. More details are then added to suggest the idea of something much mechanical going on here. Believe it or not, but these are sprues. What's peculiar about them is their section, which is half rounded and this makes them look like half embedded into the surface I stick them onto. What a great effect, I wish I had a ton of these. Looking at the front of the chariot, I just felt it was lacking some bold, striking detail. Just like this one, for example, from the movie The Gladiator, that has a big medusa's head right on its front. I also wanted mine to have something like a big, eye-catching blazon 
that would dishearten any possible opponent. And this is the funkiest I could get in making an alien blazon to stick on the front of the control pod using wall plugs, toy bits and other plastic scraps. Question is, is this only a blazon or is it also a lethal weapon? And if so, how should it work? I've got to say that it blew up my mind to find out that inside VHS tapes one could actually find ancient Roman chariot wheels. I mean, using Jar Jar Binks words, this is nutsin! Check out these awesome bits here, they happen to have a very textured surface and they also have wheel spokes. And by the way, I absolutely love their cogged edge. I mean, these bits must have been designed for us scratch builders to use in our models, come on! I increased the width of the wheels, gluing on them a ring cut from a pretty big PVC pipe. The back of the wheels, though, looks empty and dull. And since it's gonna show up in the finished model, I had better think about a way to gribble it a little. My idea is to use sprues to make spokes also on the inside, and other custom cut plastic bits to create geometrical patterns that might suggest the idea of circuits and machinery. A cool feature I certainly don't want my chariot to miss are the spikes on the wheels. And disposable fork sprungs are what seems to be a great option to reproduce them. The wheels look flat though. Some stripes cut from fruit mesh bags might be a good solution to add some juicy texture on them. Check this out! Everything starts from here, from these cool shaped yogurt plastic bottles. The beautifully detailed plastic top of a pepper grinder <laughs> is chosen to be the first bit to bulk out the back of the engines, together with a temper evident band from a cleaning supply bottle. I see how the details of this bit suggest a rotating movement. Very cool, I think. Modified super glue caps are also added. Now it's time to make the yogurt bottles look like actual thrusters, what do you think? And the first bits to be glued on them are these bits, harvested from a broken airplane toy. Ladies and gentlemen, plastic mesh is back, cut into stripes, is glued around the body of the engines to create interesting, unusual decoration patterns intended to recall those ones on the chariot. Raging racing horse heads are placed on top of both engines to function both as wind cutters and maybe blades. Since the control pod is inspired by the looks of ancient Roman chariots, I felt that a couple of raging studs would fit just fine into the overall concept. These horse heads are made overlapping a sequence of three layers of clear plastic sheets, then shaped using a fret saw. The horse heads are then poked into the bottles right along the mold parting line in an attempt to conceal it. The bond is reinforced from the inside of the bottles, applying L-shaped plastic scraps ravaged from CD casings and a couple rounds of super glue plus baking powder. Then an ink printer cartridge cut into a half is used to make the lower portion of both racing engines providing them with big frontal intake air scoops. To get a perfect fit, I worked them using a cardboard tube wrapped in sandpaper. Now these scoops will glue nice and slug right onto the convex surface of the bottles. I must say this plastic mesh really caught my imagination. I started drawing what I believe to be simple yet interesting geometrical patterns 
intended to break the monotony of the flat surface of the engines and create some decoration motifs that would immediately recall those ones on the chariot. So, how do you like it? Not bad, not bad! I don't glue the scoops yet, and you'll understand why very soon. And now, it's on to making the energy binder. Let me tell you, a pretty interesting feature of this build. I provide both engines with hatches that can be opened at will. I do this to grant me access to the inside of the bottles, and be able to do all the wiring needed to reproduce the energy binder arc. The hatches closing mechanism is made with a couple little magnets for model making that stick to a couple nails I poked through the plastic bottles. The hatches are made with overlapping layers obtained from another bottle of the same kind, so to match the exact same curve of the engines. These round bits from a brick toy line make nice energy binder plates, don't you think so? Again, using sandpaper on a cardboard tube, I sand the bottom of them till I get a perfect fit on the hatches. Now to add some details on all the spots of the engines that feel too empty. Starting from some hemispherical rivets obtained from soft air plastic bullets. Oh, by the way, did I show you guys my Zen technique to make hemispherical rivets? I don't believe I did actually. Me le va a far vedere una veloce. Ammazza, oh, me pare Speedy Gonzales. These leftovers from disposable forks handles seem to be the perfect bits to reproduce vents, intake air scoops. I shorten them a bit, give them an angle, and glue them on selected spots on the surface of the engines. Let's now continue with some sci-fi paneling to create some sense of depth on the surface of the engines. Here I'm using pretty thick layers of plastic cut from an identical plastic bottle. I first make cardboard templates and then cut the plastic following their outline. To give some of the panels even more visual depth, I glue on top of them a second panel of smaller size. The energy binder hatches get some paneling as well. The paneling continues on the air scoops with some of this clear plastic card, which is the cover of an old notebook one panel glued onto another. Other bits like sprues and small buttons are also applied for the sake of visual interest. The horse heads are upgraded, converting drop-shaped glitters into raging eyes. To make the flat neck of the horses more interesting, much inspired by the design of Motus Strider, I use needle files of different shapes to score grooves all along them. I designed the Cosmic Auriga with no hands, but instead, long chains coming out right from his forearms and connecting him to both racing engines. To firmly connect the chains to the engines, I use little screw eyes. And at this point, the engines are quite done, I think. They should be tested now. It's working! It's working!
Central pod needs a pilot. Being this pod racer inspired by an ancient Roman chariot, I figured the pilot had to have some resemblances with an auriga. That is the Latin word for charioteer in ancient Rome. I imagine the charioteer to be an alien controlled unit in the shape of a torso, firmly connected to the chariot through the cylinder device. In my mind, I imagine this cylinder rotating in an endless motion while these little poles topped with circles go up and down, up and down restlessly, just like the horses on a merry-go-round. At first, my idea was to model the cosmic auriga according to the looks of the gold saint Seiya knights, but when I saw this pose here, I immediately switched to the simple yet captivating aesthetics of the magno-powered micronauts instead. I first made an armature for the figure using the stiff, resilient iron wire of a cloth hanger, a marker pen barrel, and beads for elbows. At the end of the arms I made hooks, and that is to secure the chains. And this is the armature, ready for the clay to be applied. I don't feel comfortable at all working DAS with sculpting rake tools, and sure enough, I'm not the only person to think this way. When modeling, instead of scraping away chunks of clay from the surface with rake tools, like you would normally do working regular clay, I find it safer to work it in this fashion, with something round and tapered, like a knitting needle, for example, or the handle of a brush. Or in some other circumstances, cutting off little chunks of dust with a sharp tool might also work fine. Even better if you get the blade wet. I find sculpting small and detailed subjects with dust air dry clay quite challenging. Dust is a bit sloppy, mushy, and that's a fact, but for sure is much more accessible than other types of clay. And this is why in this project I chose DAS to model the main bulk of the figure. Now I'm scraping away masses of clay from the waist of the figure to make a belt decoration. This is risky, but I've already performed deep cuts all around the waist of the figure, so I think there's not gonna be any problem. I use a couple of silicone tip tools to smoothen the mess I just did with the knife. Definitely get yourself some silicone tip tools, they're a must for this type of clay. And this is the end of the first session of sculpting. I come back the day after, finding the torso of the figure already hardened. In this phase, with utility knife and sandpaper, I correct all those mistakes I did not dare to deal with when the clay was still wet and mushy. Now that the clay is dry, removing all these flaws is nothing but a cakewalk. As you guys can see, what I'm doing here is working the clay sometimes when it's wet, some other times when it's already hardened, depending on my needs, to get a result as sleek as I can. This might look like cheating, but hey, the important thing here is the result. Now that the chest has become hard, I have way more control in scoring grooves on it, and I do so using a round needle file. Looking at it, it makes me think about the armor of a Roman centurion. I'm pretty pleased with the result. On the hardened surface, I can use milliput clay to make some small details. The main shape of the forearms is made carving two hollow cylinders of dried clay. Once shaped, the ridges along the forearms are modeled using milliput clay on the hardened surface. I have never used milliput clay before, and it was pretty nice to find out that it can be smoothened out with water just like dust clay. I designed the charioteer in a way that is connected to the two engines by means of six chains that literally stem from its forearms, functioning as reins. The original concept for the head sculpt was quite different from the result, actually. Sculpting the big crest using this kind of sloppy clay seemed to be something that ought to be avoided by all means. So I figured I would cut the shape I wanted right from a hardened disc of clay, and then sculpt the two sides of the head. <laughs> the boy's good, no doubts there! The sculpt undergoes many changes as the process goes forward. At this point, without a sketch to follow anymore, I do whatever seems to feel right. 
A good idea to smoothen out the surface might be that one of using a wet brush with hard bristles, while the clay is still wet. I use milliput clay again to sculpt some other details here and there, and laid a coat of matte varnish all over the clay to prepare it for the painting job. And now that all the components are finished, I'm finally ready to paint it. I first cover the whole model with a coat of Games Workshop Chaos Black Primer. If I told you guys that each time I have to paint a model I feel absolutely confident about what I'm doing, well that would be the biggest lie ever. I decided then to keep this one as simple as I could. I imagined this pod razor in black, and I knew from the very beginning that I didn't want any sign of weathering on it, or rusting, or chipping anything like that. I imagined it to have a very neat look, to be a slick alien piece of machinery. And when it came to choose a color scheme, the Warhammer 40K's Chaos Space Marine Black Legion seemed to offer the best choice for what I had in mind, and a relatively easy paint job at the same time. The first colors I'm gonna apply on the model are the metal colors. Games Workshop Rune Lord Brass, to paint the mesh decoration I used extensively both on the engines and on the chariot, but also to paint the spokes of the wheels, inside and outside, and the ridges on the Cosmic Auriga's forearms. Games Workshop Retributor Armor, mainly to paint all the hemispherical rivets, both on the engines and on the chariot. but also the Auriga's helmet and part of the cylinder, in an attempt to make all these details stand out from the background. After all the effort and all the lobby I put into this bit, I would be quite disappointed if it came out flat and dull. I very much like this warm gold color, by the way. The third metal color I'm going to apply is Games Workshop Lead Belcher, to paint most of the details and machinery parts on the engines. Like the mane of the horses, the air intakes, the paneling, the energy binder plates, and the nozzles. The marvelous details on the pepper grinder and on the zip ties are brought up with a lead belcher dry brush. The wheels also get some lead belcher around the hub to achieve some visual contrast with the brass. A very gentle lead belcher dry brush is performed to bring up the texture of the fruit mesh bag and the details inside the wheels. Lead belcher is also used in combination with that same warm gold to paint the big alien blazon I placed right in the front of the chariot. And for the Auriga's crest and armor. <laughs> Uh, time for washes, this must be. I now proceed using Agrax Earthshade for a generous wash over the brass. Rakeland Flash Shade to wash over the gold. And that should give a visually nice red hint to it. Null Noil over all the areas I previously covered with Lead Belcher. The whole torso of the Auriga gets also showered with Agrox Earthshade, helmet and crest included. The helmet needs more darker areas, I think. I would like to create really defined shadows caused by a zenithal light, so I perform a second wash, adding a little bit of black to the Agrox Earthshade wash. 
After the washes, I now come back with the same three metal colors used before and do some highlighting in an attempt to make all these metals pop up. First comes the Rune Lord brass. I do it carefully, loading the brush with the least paint I can, almost performing a dry brush. I carefully hit only the upper edges of the details. Those ones exposed to an ideal zenithal light source. Then comes the Retributor armor. I use Runefang Steel, a much brighter silver color, to highlight all the spots I previously covered with Lead Belcher. And with a really thin brush, I apply it also on the upper edges of the other metals as a final highlighting step. I would like to perform a nice and smooth transition from black to bright silver on both the horse manes. I had never heard about a black dry brush, and anyway it didn't seem to work out when I tried it, so with an old brush with shortened bristles, I start to smear on the mains black paint straight from the pot. I don't believe this is a widespread painting technique or something, it's rather me messing around, having fun and experimenting a bit. I surely like the rough, dirty texture that it leaves on the surface though. I like it so much that I give the Cosmic Arigas crest the same treatment. And when I feel that the transition from black to silver is smooth enough, I give the top of the horse manes a blue hint with Games Workshop Drakenhof Nightshade to make them look more, you know, I don't know, I just feel like it. Actually, to me, manes like these look like blades the Auriga might use to slash his enemies. The nozzles of the engines also get both the black dry brush, let's call it this way for the sake of simplicity, and the blue wash, this time to suggest the idea of burned metal. It is time now for the very last details. The gemstones on the base of the cylinder get to be colored in red and green, and the little circles on top of the poles are filled with Games Workshop Tesseract Glow, then also covered with gloss varnish. This seems to be the brightest option among the colors I have at the moment, to make these details rise and shine. The Cosmic Auriga gets his almond-shaped gemstone colored. I imagine this to be some sort of interface through which he can be in constant communication with the vehicle he operates. And as a matter of fact, if you remember from before, the inside of the chariot has another one of these gemstone-like alien devices to pair with that one of the Auriga. As often happens in my models, at least so far, the final touch consists in an indiscriminate zenithal light silver dry brush. And in this particular case, this final step much helped to bring out all the really nice texture found on the surface of the head peak. And, very important I would point out, to highlight all the details in black on the engines, especially the vents, and the scores on the horse's necks. This moon surface diorama with craters is entirely made with dust, air dry clay. It weighs a ton and cat litter, some of which unbroken, some grounded to powder with a rolling pin. Painted with a very light grey, washed with a mixture of darker grey and black, much diluted in water, and then dry brushed with the original light grey.
inspiration for this project of mine is a pod racer, I cannot say that this model fits in the Star Wars pod racing environment really. Too sleek and too shiny to fit. I rather conceived it as a good alien entity coming from the darker space, rocketing through the galaxies at a comet-like speed. Pretty realistic, this energy by the arc is. I can't believe it. This is nuts. <laughs> this model will soon be sent to the eternal city of Rome. What a coincidence. Not for joining a race in the Colosseum, though, but to take part in what sounds to be a pretty prestigious model making exhibition and contest. I'm actually really excited about this, because this is gonna be, for me, the first time ever to compete in a model making contest. And I'm really curious as well, to see if amongst the other models being judged, there's gonna be some scratch bashing, some kit bashing, some junk bashing, you know. Last time I went to a model making exhibition in Italy, I didn't see no scratch bashing at all. I don't know which is the current situation in your country, but in Italy, it looks to be like this. Sure enough though, in one of my next videos, I'll keep you guys posted on the current scratch bashing situation in Italy. As always, thank you for sticking around until the end of the video. I grasp this opportunity to thank immensely all the new subscribers to the channel and uh, all the people who like, share and comment on my work. Your support is priceless and makes my commitment grow stronger day by day. That's it for today, until next time you all take care and stay creative. Bye!